Welcome to the checkerboard project. This is about creating files, learning about layers, opacity levels, making shapes, fill, strokes, duplication, and the node tool, which we kind of discussed in class today, as of when I'm recording this, and we will be going over this again tomorrow, but this video will go over it in a bit more depth, and also you can reference this throughout the project. So let's start with the toolbar. This first one is the selection tool. It's just a regular cursor, regular arrow. This is what you'll use for pretty much everything, including selecting shapes, moving things, whatever you need to do. Now, when you have an object selected, it is content aware, so it will change the settings. And the first one is multiple selection. This is useful for picking out little individual pieces, but it will select all of them on a one by one basis. And then the duplication tool. Keep in mind that both of these can be toggled and left on. Duplication can duplicate shapes as many times as you click and pick one up. So be careful not to leave it on because you'll end up with 50 shapes stacked on top of each other. This is the node tool and the node tool is used for messing with anchor points, which is what all shapes and objects are made up of. Similarly, when you're in that tool, you also have the multiple selection tool. It does the exact same thing as the regular selection and same with duplication. It's just so you don't have to switch back and forth between them, but they both have the same settings. They do the same things. They also have rotate, which, well, rotates objects. <laughs> and they also have the scale tool, which will make things bigger or smaller, depending on what you need. When you select the shape tool, you can do squares, polygons, circles, stars, lines, and a little swirlies, but mainly we're going to be messing with the shapes. And once you have a shape selected, you get an adjustment bar. The adjustment bar varies. For a square, for example, it determines how round your edges are. If you want kind of rounded edges, you can just lift the bar a little bit. But otherwise, you'll get one that will adjust either how many sides something has or how many points it has in the case of a star. So it can adjust those quantities to ridiculous values, but you know, better than making the shape manually. So let's get into the project. This is mainly gonna involve duplication, shapes, strokes and fills, and managing your selection tools appropriately, as well as your layers. You guys are gonna download a TIFF from Shobi. I also have the Vectornator file in there. I don't know if it'll let you download it, but I threw in both as a backup plan. For the purposes of this, we're starting with the TIFF. You guys will download that into your photos or files, and when you make a new document, you will open the file directly. Whenever you're tracing something, you need to adjust its opacity, okay? Because otherwise you'll have the exact same saturation of color for both your object and what you're tracing. Always make the base layer at least 50% opaque. And when you have that layer selected, you can adjust the bar down at the bottom. And then once you have that layer adjusted for opacity, rename it. To change the name of a layer, select the layer so it's highlighted in gray and then tap the layer title once your keyboard should show up. And then you need to lock the layer. Oh my gosh, um, there's a little lock right next to the eyeball and in between the thumbnail and the title. You need to click that lock and make sure that it is shut. That means you won't be able to mess with anything in that layer. So that template layer will just stay there and you can draw on top of it all day long without messing up its positioning. Once you have your base tracing layer locked, add another layer on top of it if you don't have one already. I can't remember if Vectornator adds one automatically or not. This layer will be your starting working layer that will put the base shape in. Never trace in your template layer. So next we gotta talk about shapes, and I kinda showed how this works, but in your shape tool, we need to make a bunch of squares. Because first off, that yellow background is just one single square. So we need to make that base on which we can set everything else. So this bar that comes up whenever you select square, it determines how round your edges are, like I said. For this, we won't need any rounded edges, so make sure that that value is set to zero. But you can kind of see how those can change. Um, always make sure that your corners are sharp for this particular project. Wow, I drew way too many of these when I was recording this, oh well. So make sure that you are set to zero and let's make this base layer. We're gonna place this down in our newest layer and we need to make it yellow. So it defaults to either black or 
transparent and clicking that little double arrow button right there can switch the fill and the stroke pretty easily. In this case, we want our square to be yellow with no stroke. And I will put a disclaimer here. Stroke is imprecise, when, especially when tracing. If you're tracing something, a good rule of thumb is that if you have a stroke, you have already flunked the assignment because that stroke skews your perception of where the edge of your shape actually is. If you're tracing something, either have no fill and no stroke, or just fill, and that's it. And as you can see, I was a little bit off, so I'm going to reposition this and place it there. Oh, I accidentally moved it. I'm zooming in to double check my corners, very important. Getting it as close as humanly possible to the actual tracing. I realize that this tracing is not pixel perfect, even though it is a TIFF. I made this a long time ago. Someday I will remake it for you and export that and you guys will be able to trace it. But for right now, I just didn't have time. You guys need to get as close as possible to those pixels just to line it up. Now I have renamed my first layer um, yellow box. And once I did that, I locked the layer and then clicked that eyeball. That eyeball shows you either what's visible and if you turn it off and you see a dash through it, that means everything that's in that layer is invisible. It's still there, it hasn't gone away, you just can't see it. So in the case of tracing, very, very helpful. I'm gonna rename this layer spaces because I'm gonna do all of the red and black squares. Now you guys are gonna turn in a screen recording of this and I don't wanna see anybody tracing these squares individually. You maybe need to do three or four and then you should start duplicating as you go. Now notice that the square is yellow, that's okay. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna go back into my style panel and I'm going to grab that eyedropper right next to the yellow. And I'm gonna click on that space. The eyedropper looks through opacity to see what color it's supposed to be. So instead of giving you like a grayed out color, it'll give you the true black that the original photo actually is. And then you're gonna use your duplication tool with your regular selection. Now notice that I placed it there and then I had to adjust it a little bit. I had to uncheck duplication before I moved it. Cause again, otherwise every time you move that shape you're gonna end up with another one stacked on top of it. So since I moved it like two or three times I would have had two or three shapes right there. An eyedropper tool to grab that red. So cool, we have two shapes. I'm going to use my multiple selection tool and click on both of them. Or you can use a dragged selection pane. And so you can separate them with that tool. But I'm going to select both of them and then I'm going to hit that duplication tool, that second button, toggle it on. And then I'm going to grab those two and move them over. Double check, turn off duplication. And then select all of them, duplicate, move over. Zoom in to check, turn off duplication. Double check your edges. They're still selected, so if I move one, I will move all of them. And I'm getting as close to the core black pixels behind it as I possibly can. And again, after you move something, it will remain selected until you purposely click off of it. So even if you're zoomed in, you will know that your former selection of multiple squares will still be there. So now I have an entire row. So now I'm going to select all of them with the selection pane. Selection pane doesn't have to go around the shape. It just has to touch the edges. So I duplicated that entire row and then turned off duplication to move it into place. And they all still remain selected. So then I can adjust and go from there. Double checking some of my squares. You 
and one of those was off, so I'm gonna shift that a little bit. This is painstaking detailed work, but the attention to detail does pay off, and it is stuff that I will be looking for. So now I have those two rows, and if I selected them, I could move them independently, but again, I'm gonna toggle that duplication. And I'm gonna shift those down and one over. That's pretty well lined up, actually. So then I have those two black ones over there that I'm not quite sure what to do with. So I'm gonna grab those two and shift them over to fit. Never waste a shape. Okay, so we officially have half of the board. Awesome. So then to finish the other half, all we have to do is select everything. Turn on duplication. So all we have to do is select everything, turn on duplication, and set it in roughly the general vicinity, and then zoom in and line it up a little bit more. I didn't have smart guides on when I was doing this, so I was just kind of eyeballing it really fast. Oh well. Be better than me. Use your smart guides. Trust them to help you. So then if we make sure that we turn on the visibility of both of those layers, we can see how it's coming together. We have the yellow background, and we have the red and black spaces. It kind of hurts your eyes a little bit if you're looking at it for too long. But again, you can turn that visibility on or off, but then we're gonna lock the spaces layer, add a new layer, and turn the visibility of the spaces layer off. And we're gonna rename this fourth layer pieces. So going into the shape tool, hit the dot, 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 select your circle. Now to make a perfect circle, if you just clicked and dragged, you wouldn't get a perfect circle. To constrain proportions on your iPad, when you're dragging, and this is tricky, but you have to remember the order. Let's say you're right-handed and you draw that circle and drag it with your right hand. It's not proportionate, it's an oval, usually. If you are dragging that circle and without lifting your Apple Pencil or stylus, whatever, without lifting your Apple Pencil, you press your finger against the screen it will constrain that proportion. If you let go of that finger on the screen, it will snap back to non-proportion. So make sure that if you want to make a proportion circle, leave your finger on the screen and then lift your pen up off of it first. The order there is very particular because if you let go of your finger off that screen even for a second earlier than you intended, it'll throw off the proportions. And when you're making repeated shapes, then that can be tricky. So I'm sizing this circle to sit right in the center of that yellow because the yellow around that blue piece is actually a stroke. When you have a stroke, it expands out from the center of the edge. Like imagine that there's just this tiny little outline. That stroke doesn't just show up on the outside edge of that. It is equidistant. I don't know if that makes sense, but you can kind of see that there. You can see the thin line in between the really thick yellow stroke. And that's what I mean when I say, when you're tracing something, do not have your stroke on. Either have your fill on or have nothing and just use the basic lines from the program because otherwise it will not be precise. Stroke lies to you, and that, see, that's how thick stroke can be. But you can see where the baseline is versus where the stroke actually ends. It's ridiculous. But that stroke width slider, you can either tap it and enter that value, or you can slide it as you did with the layer opacity. I'm gonna kind of resize it a little bit, make sure it really settles in there. And that looks nice, but oh no, it is the wrong color. 
But does that matter? No, it does not. So I'm going to duplicate it, put it over here, and then I'm going to keep it selected and use my eyedropper. Always make sure that you have the selection active because if you just use your eyedropper and select something, cool, you've changed the fill for the shape that you could create next, but not the shape that you just created. You need to make sure that with your regular selection tool, you have the shape chosen and then use the eyedropper and then it'll fill it in. I'm gonna duplicate this red piece and throw it over here later because I'll use it there, maybe. And then I'm gonna change the color of this piece up here with the eyedropper. Eyedropper just pulls specific colors from wherever it is, wherever you're pointing. So I'm gonna select these three and I'm gonna turn on duplication and set them there. Get them as close as I can. Now notice that they're a little bit off. Um, because I wasn't using smart guides, I kind of had to go back through and adjust these individually. You can do that. It's not like the end of the world if you do. Um, kind of up to you. Smart guides will help you out a little bit more here. Okay, then I've got those six pieces. So I'm just going to select all six and mirror them down below. Now again, we're kind of off. So I'm gonna click out of it and then adjust each one. Okay, so we got our blue pieces. So now it's time to do the red ones. And I left a red one over here, but I decided that I don't really want to use it. Seems like it would take too much time. I'm instead going to use the pieces that I already have here. Now I could move them over, but we have the problem that they're out of place. I need to flip them upside down. So I'm going to go into my arrange panel and we'll talk more about what these are later. And I had my duplication on accidentally, so I had to untoggle it before I did this. But right there in the panel, there's a flip button. It'll reflect it over a middle axis, either side to side or up and down. You can also do it by hand by grabbing that orange handle. And hallelujah, you can set it to whatever. The only downside of doing it by hand is that you can't really get it to straighten back up easily. So it's usually best to just go into the arrange panel and use the flip function. And then let's arrange those in there. And they're off, because I suck. I swear my next project will be fine, because we'll finally have smart guides. So we have those blue pieces, but we need to make them red. So select all of them, eyedropper for the fill, Just pulled red from one of the spaces and called it good. It leaves the stroke the same. Then we need three more blue pieces over here, so duplication's turned on. Boom, set it right there, grab another. And we're good to go, and every piece is officially done. I think my screen recording freaked out here, but basically what happened um, was I just made a new layer on top called stars. And I locked and made the pieces layer invisible so that my only working layer that I can do anything in is stars. Stars are the last part of this and some people think they're the trickiest part and I can understand that because we have to use our direct selection tool or the node tool. I don't like that word, node. Anyway, the direct selection tool messes with stars. Did this, like, my recording messed up, so I'm going back in and doing this later, so that's why the checkerboard isn't there temporarily. 
but I'm gonna show you guys how to do the stars and it doesn't necessarily matter, but when you do this, um, remember how your slider sets your number of sides and you can always enter it manually. You need eight sides for this, oh, eight points. Really, I don't wanna say sides, but when you drag that star, it's not gonna look right. And I kinda showed you guys how to do this in class, but for the sake of this, first off, let's get rid of that stroke. Let's just switch. And then let's get rid of that stroke altogether so that it's just a clean yellow edged shape. Now, going into our node tool or direct selection tool, if I like to call it, and will call it because node is a stupid word. Um, if you have that selected, all of your anchor points show up. That's what those little white dots are. Any point that a line travels between in graphic design is called an anchor point. It anchors that line in place. And so each corner of this shape is an anchor point. And the node tool is used for messing with those anchor points. So if I tap on one, it'll activate to be black. Your active anchor point will always, always, always be black. So we don't really need to mess with the points of the star because those should be in roughly the correct place. We need to mess with the inside points of the star. And there is a way to do this with the template, but we're gonna do it by hand because you will need to know how for later. But as long as you have that active, you can pull those points, oh God, you can pull those points directly inward and go as far as you need to. If you do end up doing that, um, that's messing with your anchor handles for the point and that'll turn it into a curve and that's more pen tool stuff that we're not really ready for yet. But as long as you just click on the point and start dragging it, you can do whatever the heck you want with it. But that is how you shape those stars to fit in that little piece. They should touch the edges and match up relatively closely. Okay, going back to the regular video because I don't think the rest of it's messed up, but I could be wrong. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, everything's complete. I, as long as I have the stars in there, you can make every layer visible and it should be correct. And going back to your gallery, you can rename it checkerboard. And then with your last name, please, please label it with your last name. When I download all of these to look at them, I need to know who's is who's, otherwise I'll have 15,000 files labeled checkerboard, which is uh, not good. Once you have it labeled, you will need to actually save it to your file. So go up to your um, sharing button and continuity, you'll see files right there. Go ahead and click on that. And then you should have your file label backup that you made the other night. And then just save it to that file. Then what you gotta do is you gotta go back to Shobi and go to import file. Then go into your files, find your backup folder and select the Vectornator file that you just worked on. Checkerboard, last name, Vectornator. So, and that is what you upload to Shobi. But that's all that's required. Duplication, fills and strokes, shapes, etc. You've done it, congrats. You can do most everything in Vectornator and Illustrator now. Congrats, it's amazing. Hope you guys are ready for your next assignment, which is the uh, pen tool. <laughs> Everybody's least favorite thing at first. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye.